Okay, so uh, so I will briefly leave you what we learned in the previous class. So actually, in the uh, previous class, we learned the two popular performance metrics for computer system. So, two metrics are response time and throughput. Then, what is the meaning of response time? <laughs> time gap between the start and the end of time of an of application on, on a certain computer system. Okay? And then, what is the meaning of will do? You need to remember, right? The amount of work done within a unit time, right? Okay, so, Actually, these are very uh, important and then uh, popular performance metrics for computer systems. Actually, uh, we use uh, similar uh, performance metrics for different systems and different uh, social systems or companies also for humans. <laughs> so we can use for the uh, we can use these two uh, performance metrics for employees. Okay. <laughs> so, so I mentioned that we need to remember the definition of the performance. Actually, uh, in, so I mentioned that uh, in this class, in this course, we will focus on the response time as the performance metric, and then we will also focus on the CPU time. So, as I explained that, so when a when an application is executed on a uh, certain computer systems, the performance can the performance of this application can be influenced by many factors such as operating system and then IO devices, uh, something like that. So we we will focus on the CPU time that is the pure execution time. Only the CPU uh, execute the this application only. Okay. So we will focus on the CPU time. <clears throat> so I explained that you need to understand how instructions are executed by a CPU. Also, you need to understand the clock signal, right? So these are two important uh, working mechanism, working mechanism of a CPU. So firstly, you need to understand how how instructions are executed by a CPU, and then also you need to understand the clock, clock, one clock signals uh, in the CPU. Okay. Then, as as we uh, define the performance like the the inverse of the response time or execution time, then we can. We can also uh, make the equation of the CPU time, that is the execution time, is the number of clock cycles multiplied by clock period or clock cycle time. And then this equation can be also like this. Okay. So please, so please remember that this equation. This is very uh, popular equation for uh, representing the components of a uh, computer system. So uh, it means the execution time is instruction count multiplied by CPI. What is the CPI? What is the CPI? Clock cycles per instruction, right? So you need to remember, right? CPI. So CPI is a very important uh, concept or important uh, performance metric actually. Okay. So actually, so you need to know the, the definition of the CPI because also this equation will be really asked in the beta exam, right? Also, during the homework. Also, uh, it's, it will be asked uh, in the homework assignment. So CPU time. CPU time is the instruction count multiplied by CPI multiplied by clock period. So like the IC instruction count. 
multiplied by CPI and then multiplied by CC, the clock theorem. And then I was explained that so instruction count and then CPI can be influenced by SOPIA, that is the algorithm of your program. And then program language will affect the IC instruction count and CPI also compiler influences IC instruction count and CPI. And then ISA instruction set architecture such as x86 or R architecture influences everything. <laughs> instruction count, CPI, and the lab theory. Okay, so actually I I was not uh, able to explain what this concept means in the previous class because we don't have enough time, but I'll, I'll explain. So sometimes we can use MIPS as the performance metric. So actually the MIPS represent millions of instructions per second. So it is a million M instructions, right? So it's a MIPS. It is called MIPS. Also, the MIPS is the, the name of the instruction architecture. It's a very old instruction architecture. So do not be confused. But uh, so in this slide, so we use MIPS as the instruction. Uh, so I introduced MIPS as a, another performance metric. Okay, so what does it mean? What is the meaning of MIPS? So as, you, as, as, I, as I mentioned, it is millions of instructions per second. So we can count the number of instructions executed by a CPU, right? We can count the number of instructions. Also, we can measure the response time of this application, okay? Then we can divide the number of instructions and we can divide the number of instructions with the response time. Then it means, so, and then, you know, this is the millions, so then we can divide the number of instructions with, with the 10 to the power of six is millions, right? So, this is the definition. So which means that it means that the so, number of instructions executed in a unit time. So what does that mean? If the MIPS is high, it means performance is also high, right? More instructions can be executed by a computer. So which means the performance can be high. Right? So which means that we can use the MIPS as the and, uh, another performance metric. But sometimes we cannot use MIPS as a performance metric. Why? So uh, I will use this blank. Uh, it's not my power. Why? Sometimes the terminology MIPS can mislead us to the some wrong direction. Why? <laughs> because number of instruction, number of instruction from high level language code can be different. By what can be different by ISA? Also, compiler. Okay, so I will take the example. So, this is the same hello world code. It's hello world, hello.c, .c. and then we can compile this high level language code using x86 compiler. Or we can compile this high level language code using ARM compiler. Then 
instructions will be generated. The compiler will generate the instruction. So x86 instructions will be generated, and then x86 instructions will be generated. So this, this is the same program, but ISA is different. Then the number of generated instructions will be different. Okay. Because the, the instruction, instruction set. So that is the promised instruction. So if the instruction is different, then the and the compiler will generate the different number of instructions. For example, the x86 can generate the eight arm, generate the 100 instructions, 100 instructions. The arm compiler can generate the 500 instructions from the same high level language code, hello.c code. Then, then x86 executed this hello.c. And then the execution time can be two seconds, right? And then and the, the ARM CPU can also execute the this compile hello.c code. Then the execution time can be three seconds. So which computer, so which CPU is a better CPU? So which means that the which CPU exceeds the Higher performance. So x86 it takes two seconds and then ARM CPU takes three seconds. Which CPU is better? Which CPU is better? Why? Right. x86 is better because the execution time is short. Right? But we can uh, calculate the means and like the number of instructions per second. So in this in this, in this example, the instruction count is small, so I will just show the number of instructions per second. How about the XM6? It's 100 divided by 2, it's 50. 50 instructions per second. How about the arm? 5 divided by 3, it's about the 103, <laughs> So if we just if we just compare the means, then which CPU is better? So I said that oh, this is high, then it can be the performance can be high because more instructions can be executed per second. But in this example, the arm arm CPU exhibit the more the higher means, right? The number of instructions per second is higher. But we already know that the performance of x86 is higher than the arm CPU. So in order to use means, then the ISA needs to be the same. Also the compile option. The compiler option needs to be the same. Then we can use means. Otherwise, you cannot use means as a performance metric. So sometimes uh, the, uh, the students can be confused because, oh, more instructions can be uh, executed, then it's better. But it's not already true. Okay. Okay, so this is the meme. So, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I will uh, explain about the power work. So it, it means the power consumption of a processor. So until now, so until this time, this, this slide, I have explained about the performance of a CPU. So I said that the performance is the, the number of priority of the uh, CPU development or CPU research. And then the another, another, Goal of our research is to reduce the cost, the cost of a, of a computer system. And then the power work, power, then is the power consumption of a CPU or computer system. So this, this stack is related to the cost, cost of a 
computer system. Also, this is a very important issue, right? Then, so then let's see the power trend about CPU. So in this graph, you can see the uh, clock rate on the on a y axis. Also, you can see the uh, different processors. So, so by year, by or by generation on, on x axis. So also you can find that our uh, clock rate is the low scale, low scale, and then also you can find the power, the the power consumption of by a CPU. So this is linear scale. Okay. So on from the A to A6 process, so this is the very old generation CPU by Intel. And then also until the Pentium 4 place card, the Pentium 4 place card, so around the 2004. So it, it was uh, <coughs> introduced in 2004. So we can find that clock rate, the clock frequency increases continuously, right? So, so you need to remember that this is the low scale. So, which means uh, actually the clock frequency has had increased exponentially until 2004. So it reaches 3.6 gigahertz. But after that, we can notice that, oh, clock frequency is main, has, has been maintained, right? So after the first part, you for break cut, the clock frequency is around the uh, two two point six gigahertz to the three point four gigahertz. It's a, it's it's a nearly the same. Okay, so uh, when you learn about the uh, performance of a computer system, what's the execution time? Execution time is instruction time. CPI and PC, clock period. And then we can actually performance is the one over execution time, right? So this is the instruction count, CPI, PC, one over one. And then we can rewrite the this equation like the instruction count, multiply CPI, and clock frequency, right? So which means that the performance usually, usually the perform so if the instruction count and then is the instruction count and CPI is the same, not the same. So this means that the is the same and the architect is the same. Then the performance, the performance of CPU is proportional to the frequency, clock frequency, right? So, so what does that mean? Clock rate or well, clock frequency has increased exponentially, which means that until Pentium for Prista, we can say the performance of a, a computer has increased exponentially, right? It's amazing, right? Now, how about the power? So, for the 80 to 86 processor, the power consumption of a CPU was 3.3 watts. It's amazing, right? The recently, what is the GDP of the Intel CPU? It's for the desktop CPU, it was 60, 65 watts. And then, but uh, recently, the, the CPU uh, runs in a, with a very high frequency. Then it will reach around the 100 watts for the desktop computer. For the mobile computer, then the CPU will consume the less power, but usually for the desktop. So this is the desktop processor, 8286. And then power consumption of this CPU was just 3.3 gigahertz. Yes. The power consumption by CPU also has increased slightly for this period. The power consumption by a CPU 
have increased dramatically, and then it reached uh, hundred watt. The so, uh, nearly the same to the the modern city in the current city U. But after that, the power consumption is it has decreased. So why? Actually, until this time, uh, around the Pentium Prisca 4, Intel, the CPU vendor, so another CPU vendor, AMD, had focused on the performance of a CPU. So they, they tried to increase the clock frequency of their CPU. But what's the side effect of this high, higher performance? The side effect of this, the power consumption is also increased, has increased dramatically. That is the disadvantage of higher performance. The cost of it is also has increased. But after that, after this point, the CPU vendors also uh, focused on the power consumption of their CPUs. So, you can notice that the power consumption is slightly as this has this decreased, but the performance that is the that is the, uh, not a real performance, but clock frequency is nearly the same to maintain. But the power consumption is decreased. So that is the trend of the uh, CPU uh, Result on CPU industry. Okay, so firstly, we just focus on the performance of CPU. So, not increasing performance, then we just, the CPU vendors have tried to increase the frequency of the uh, clock frequency of their CPU. But after that, uh, at this point, uh, they also focus on the power consumption of their CPU. Then, how can you calculate the power consumption of the most integrated circuit? So actually, not to understand the equation, you need to understand how the CMOS circuit works. Okay. But actually, uh, so as also this is the the uh, so you not to understand the equation, then you need to understand the basic knowledge uh, about the, the electric circuit system. But just try to understand, okay? So actually, so this is this is not equal. It's a proportional, okay? It's a proportional. So how consumption? So it is said that the power consumption of or uh, integrated circuit is proportional to the capacitive load. So that is the capacitance of all circuit capacitance load and square of supply voltage and clock frequency. Okay, so what does that mean? So this is CPU. So this is a CPU chip. Okay. And then you know the uh, we can build a uh, CPU using CMOS transistors. Okay, like the, the <coughs> this is the example of the CMOS transistor. The example of the inverter. Right. So there are many CMOS transistors like this in the CPU, you know, CPU. So, but actually, the mechanism, the working mechanism of the steamer circuit is that. So, we can find the actually, um, we can find capacitance here or not. Okay. So, we actually, in this circuit, so this is the output and this is the input. And then we can find the capacitance here. Okay, so this is the, actually the parasitic capacitance of the circuit. And then 
by the signal, so this is the control signal, the input signal, by this uh, voltage level of the, this input signal, then this transistor can be on what on or off. Also, this transistor can be on or off. Okay, so if this transistor is turned on, then you know this transistor is connected to the BDD. So this is the high voltage of the circuit. Also, this is same to the supply voltage. Supply voltage to the, the CPU, like the, the currently we use around the one volt, but it was about the five volt to three point three volt. The is the volt generation of the CPU. And then another node of the, the CPU circuit is connected to the ground. So when the, this CMOS is turned on, then uh, uh, this circuit is connected, then the electric charge build up, electric charges build up this capacitor. So we can change the output value. And then when the, this electric charge uh, build up this capacitor, then Power is consumed. Okay, so this is this is the D, the capacitance of this circuit, and then you know this is the supply voltage DDD, and then clock frequency represents the, the activity, the activity of this circuit. So you can understand each degree like this. If the VDD is high, so the supply voltage is high. Okay, then our circuit will consume more power because power is actually you know, electric circuit theory current multiplied by voltage, right? So if the voltage is high, then it will consume more power. Also, if this capacitance is high, then we require more charges, electric charges. So if the capacitance is high, then our circuit will consume more power and then activity. So activity means it, so we can say that clock frequency is related to the activity of this circuit. The activity is high, then the charge will move, uh, move to the this capacitance or move down to the ground. So the power, the power consumption is, can be related to the this activity, the movement of electric charge. So you can understand the, this equation like this. The power consumption, the power consumption of this circuit is related, uh, is proportional to the capacitive load, and then also it is, it is proportional to the square of voltage. That's the voltage, so it's a square, and then it's a frequency. Right. So, and then, actually, the frequency uh, from uh, <clears throat> from this CPU to this CPU, the voltage is reduced, right? So this is the uh, good news for the this CPU because the voltage is reduced. Then we can reduce the power consumption by so it's reduced from five volts to the one volt. Then the power consumption will be reduced by one over 25. Right? <laughs> Very good news, right? But how about the frequency? Frequency is increased from about a thousand times, right? So, so which means that actually, and the, we, we can increase the, the performance of the CPU by increase the clock frequency. But the good news is that we can reduce the supply voltage because of advances in semiconductor technology. If the transistor size is reduced, then we can use lower supply voltage. So that is that was the good news. Okay. So we can also we can we can just think the power consumption is just increased by storage time. Okay. But power consumption is still a very critical issue in computer systems. 
one. We use mobile phones, right? <laughs> With the smartphones, the right smartphones. And then if the, our smartphone if you consume much power, then we will not use smartphone for a long time. That is the one problem. So another problem is that actually many big companies run their data centers. And data centers actually have lots of computers. So data, data center consume huge amount of electric power. So that is very so very critical problem. So because the, the power consumption, the power consumption on CPU for the mobile phone, so it's also very critical. First of the power consumption of CPU is directly related to the cost, the running cost of our computer systems, like one cloud computer systems. That's why the power consumption is very critical. So, so we learned that the power consumption, the power consumption is related to the capacity load in the capacitor. And that is actually the this capacity load is proportional to the, the proportional area of our circuit. Okay, so it, it means if the CPU area is increased, then also the capacity load is also increased. Then the can steal of the steal of the heating, and then we can. So this is the example. So your CPU has 85% of capacity load of the CPU, and then <coughs> the voltage, supply voltage, and then the working frequency is reduced by the 50 percent. Then we can just compare the power consumption of old and new CPU. So by this definition, okay, right? about the 0 0.5 coulombs. So which means that the new CPU consume around the half of the power compared to the old CPU. Then what's the power ball? So I said that power consumption is very critical. Okay. Actually, uh, uh, I just explained about the power consumption of the of a CPU. So, but the power power world represents that we can't. So, actually, historically, we learned that so voltage supply voltage has been reduced because of thanks to the advances in semiconductor technology. But the problem is that we can't reduce voltage further. That's the problem. Still, we are using a very uh, uh, <coughs> high technology, high, high semiconductor technology, such as the 3 nanometer, or five nanometer technology. But problem is that we cannot reduce the supply voltage further, even though we use the better semiconductor technology. That is the problem. Also, heat. Heat is also a very critical problem for the CPU manufacturing. So you know, the AMD or Intel CPUs require heavy cooling systems. Right, was about the GPU. So actually, the it's it's crazy. The GPU was a person uh, very much power, and then also the cooling cooling cost for this GPU is crazy. Right. I will further explain about the the consumption issue of uh, power system. So actually, so. This is the equation of dynamic power consumption. Okay, so it's a dynamic power. So what does that mean? So dynamic power is that. So actually, when I explain about the why why power is constant in the single circuit, so dynamic. So it is because of oh, this transistor is turned on or turned off frequently. 
Also, this transistor is turned on or turned off by frequency. Due to changes of input signals, right? So, dynamic pump is that signals of disrupted is changing. The signals of disrupted uh, are changing. Then the power is consumed because of behavior of CMOS transistor circuit. Then this power consumption is called dynamic power. The signal, signal values are changing, then power is consumed. Then this is the dynamic power consumption. Then I measured the dynamic power. And what is the other power consumption? What is the, the other power consumption? What is the uh, uh, another kind of power consumption? What is the opposite of dynamic? Static, right? So we can mean static power also. We can also actually consider static power. And then recently, static power is also very high. So static power is that even though we do not use it on CPU, so which means, which means that the input signal one, so input signal of the CPU does not do not change, but the power is consumed because of our transistor is not perfect. Transistors are not perfect, perfect. So the Static power is also consumed. So, but we will focus on dynamic power in this case, uh, on this course, in this class. So, when we use a computer, so which means that the signals in CPU are changing, that power is consumed. So, this is the dynamic power. Then we can rewrite the, this dynamic power like this. So, P dynamic, the uh, dynamic power consumption is equal to alpha multiplied by C, and then square of BTV is the square of supply voltage and frequency. It's actually the same equation, right? So just alpha is newly included. So actually alpha is the uh, <coughs> active, active detector. So actually the signals can be uh, changed uh, actually uh, the uh, input signal one, input signal for this circuit can be changed, or we can just assume that the alpha is just uh, one over two, so half, zero point five. So actually, the so alpha is the characteristic of application, right? So we cannot change this using hardware. Then we will focus on the impact of transistor scaling. So which means that I mentioned that in the previous class, so five nanometer, so I mentioned that, oh, 10 nanometer technology and then five nanometer technology. So I mentioned that it's not for representative size of transistor, right? Do you remember? And actually this number represents the channel width. It's a channel width. So if the transistor technology, uh, the semiconductor technology has advanced it, then so this number is reduced. So 10 nanometer to five nanometer. So in this case, S means the scaling factor. So which means that F means the how much a transistor size is reduced. Okay. So in this case, in this case, S is the two, right? Because so 10 nanometer is reduced to the 5 nanometer, right? So the S means the scale is So this example, S is 2. And then usually, if the, uh, also I mentioned that the S is the 
distance between two default nodes. And if the distance is reduced, then we can make the faster, faster circuit because the distance is reduced. So also the another good thing is that the capacitance is also reduced because this channel is connected to the output of transistor. So P is reduced. The capacitance is reduced by one over S. So which means that so in this example, the scaling factor is two, and C is if the if we use the advanced semiconductor technology such as the five nanometer from the ten nanometer, then C becomes the one over two of the original circuit. We can also reduce the supply voltage. Okay, so supply voltage can be also can be also reduced by one over n. And the frequency, the clock frequency is related to the speed of a circuit. And I mentioned that, oh, distance is reduced, then we can make faster circuit. So, which means F is increased by 2 S. So, S is a scaling factor, S. So, then we can calculate the the power consumption. Power consumption of the, the same circuit for the pair of uh, semiconductor technology. So P is of So P is proportional to C B D D of sorry. C, E, D, D, and then square and F, and then it becomes the F over C, and then F over B, D, D, square, and then two M. So it becomes C, B, D, D, square, F, right? So what does that mean? If the scaling factor is two, then the power is reduced for the same circuit. Power is reduced by one over four. Okay, so power is, it means that power is, power becomes the one over S square of the original power, right? By this equation. And if S is, S, S is the scaling factor, so it's the distance of the channel, then the transistor size is reduced. And then we just fabricate the, this transistor of the plane. So the distance is reduced, then this can be also reduced. Okay? So the size of the circuit can be also reduced by one over S squared. Right? Because it's a 2D dimension, 2, 2, 2 d dimension, right? It means in the same area, we can, we can include more transistors. Because the transistor size is reduced by one over n here, then the number of transistors in the same area will become S square, right? Do you understand? Do you follow me? The number of transistors will, will be S square in the same area. So what does that mean? The power is reduced by one over S square, the same same area for the, for the same transistor. And the, but the number of transistors is increased by S square. And then it becomes one. So actually, it's very good news, right? So area is the same. Okay, so the area is the same, but the same area in the same area, then the power consumption is also the same. But because the transient size is reduced, then we can use 
barrel computer or barrel CPU because that is increased. So actually, this rule is called the Denard scale. So actually, this this rule or this this law it's very important law because it, and then this Denard scaling explains that if the transistor, the semiconductor technology has advanced, then we can use better computer without any increase of chip size. That means the Denard scaling. So the Denard scaling will represent that uh, the scaling factor is n on the power density, the train, the transistor. Because it, so the not the not scaling is true if only consider the dynamic power. Also, if the VDD is also scale can be scaled down, right? But so the not scaling actually has can be broken. So actually. In this era, so very old, so maybe, maybe uh, the three decades ago or two decades ago, the not scaling was true. So we can, uh, we can use a good computer or good CPU without increasing the power consumption. But if the, so as you can see, uh, in this graph, the blue line, blue line shows the power density. So you mean this is the power consumption for power consumption per nanometer. Okay, this is the power density. And then this is represents the red line represents the, the semiconductor technology zone. So which means the width of the transistor channel. So you know. This, this is the nanometer. So in 2000, it was the 180 nanometer. So which means it's, it's uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.18 micrometer technology. It, it was called the 0 0.18. But recently, 2020, uh, it was around the, uh, the 10 nanometer. I think it's the uh, now. Uh, Technology. So you can find that uh, by year, the size of transistor is reduced continuously. But by the scale, the power density should be flat, flat, should be flat. So it was true until 2006, but <laughs> as you can see, the power density increases. It's a, it's a critical problem. Power is the power is a critical problem. So it is because the power is the power is related to the and firstly running cost. So electric power is consumed, and we need to pay for this consumed electric power. So this, this is the running cost. So another problem is. If a CPU consumes more power, then the, the more heat is uh, generated from a CPU, so which means that we need to require a heavier cooling system. Also, it's related to the manufacturing cost. The power consumption also influences the, the packaging time and then the, the manufacturing cost of a chip. So that's why the power consumption is actually a critical problem or critical hurdle in the CPU manufacturing or CPU uh, industry. Okay.
And then because of the power, the CPU trend has also changed. So as I mentioned, from this time, the uh, Intel or AMD uh, had focused on performance only. They, they did not consider about the uh, consumption with their CPU religiously. But after that, you know, the clock frequency is the same, the really the same, but the power is reduced. This is because of advances in the microsoft technology. Also, another change is multi-core. So until this time, the CPU has only had only one core. The core is the independent uh, CPU unit. And then our uh, instruction can be executed by this independent unit. But until this time, uh, we have only single core CPU, but after that, Intel and AMD changed their policy. Then they uh, started to uh, make dual core or quad core and multi core architectures. So it's actually it's a dramatic power change from single core to multi core. Is it because of power, power consumption? Why? I said that everyone wants better computer. And then in order to make better computer, then we need to increase the actually clock frequency, right? But because of the power issue, we cannot increase the, this clock frequency forever, right? But everyone wants better computer. Then how can they increase the performance of computer system? We can add more cores, right? Multi cores. Then we can increase the throughput, not response time. So response time is the thing. Because only one one application is is running on the on the CPU. Then single core, and then for the single core, and then for the multi core, the response time is the same because if if the core is the same, right? But what is different? If there are more cores, then throughput is increasing, right? So after this, after this time, then we also uh, focus on the throughput of control system because the CPU is changing. CPU has been changing and changed for the multi-core architecture. Okay. So switch to multiprocessor. So multiprocessor means that it's a multiple architecture. So this graph shows the performance of a unique core. It means the single core architecture. So, so as you can see, you know, you know so this x-axis is the year, right? It's a time. And then what is the y-axis? It's the performance, the relative performance for certain BX, BAX. 11 and 780, the very old CPU, right? It's a relative performance. Also, you can find that this Y is the lowest. So, you can find that, oh, from 1986 to earlier 2000, the performance, the performance of a single core had increased by 5% per year. Amazing, right? The performance is improved by more than 50%. <laughs> so, okay, what? No, no, it's not amazing. Actually, it's amazing, right? The performance of the CPU is increased by 50% every year, right? But after that, the performance is, so this uh, trend is slow down, so slow down to the 20. Three percent. Then the recently, the performance of a single core is nearly the same, right? So this rapid increases of performance is uh, due to the advances in semiconductor technology, also the advances in 
computer architecture, to the CPU architecture, or CPU micro architecture, right? So, so we can use the better computer or better single core, but recently, the performance of a single core is nearly the same. It is because for consumption, we cannot eat, so we cannot increase the, the performance of a single core using better semiconductor technology. So in order to increase the performance dramatically like this, this trend, then we need to increase the clock frequency. But we already know that in order to increase the clock uh, frequency, then power consumption is also increased, right? So because of this, we cannot increase the clock frequency of a single core processor. So recently, the performance of single core is nearly the same. Then, which means customers will not buy single core processors. Why? Right? There's no reason to buy a new CPU because the, if a CPU is the single core CPU, then we don't need to buy new CPU if the trend is like this. Why? Right? Because the performance is the same. Even though the new CPU is launched, who will buy the CPU? So, Intel and AMD as includes more cores, multiple cores in a one CPU chip. So recently, the i i seven uh, includes the uh, eight cores, right? So eight. So, so this the CPU also includes the four to eight cores. The i9 also includes the, the four cores. So recently, the Intel so actually applied the big little uh, architecture actually. So the number of four is more than the more than eight. But usually, for the desktop computer, the uh, desktop CPU includes eight cores, eight to ten or four to four to ten cores. So it is because by adding more cores in the CPU, we cannot increase the response time of a single single thread of application, but we can increase the throughput, the amount of work done in unit time. So using the multi processor or multi core architecture, then we can increase the throughput over our computer system. Also, so recently, uh, even the desktop computer uh, runs the multiple application or multiple join or multiple process, processes, right? So, using many cores, then we can run many threads concurrently. So, which, which means we can increase the throughput, throughput over our computer system. Also, not to, not to use the parallel architecture or parallel or the, or the core architecture, we require parallel algorithms. We require parallel application. Okay, which means that the, we need the parallel programming. But compared to the uh, single thread programming, parallel programming is much more difficult. Okay, so you know, the parallel algorithm is very, very complex, then it's difficult. It's difficult to implement, right? So in order to exploit the, the benefit of a multi-core architecture, then our application, our, our application needs to be changed, change the multi-threaded applications, or our application needs to implement parallel algorithms. That is the, the difficult part of the multi core architecture and then parallel boring. Also, one of the issues is overhead. Overhead of multi core architecture. So, what does that mean? I think like this. So, you are doing group project and then two students. 
the, the two workers. Two workers are doing group project, and then the uh, both want to uh, want to uh, reduce the so give the execution time for this group project. Then what's the uh, possible way? So we cannot increase the, the performance of a individual worker, then we can add more workers at the four workers. We can add two workers, so we can we can make the four workers to this group project. So what is the expected result? The performance can be two life, two times of the this situation, this configuration actually. We, we already know that even though we uh, even though we add more workers, well, even though we uh, do group project with more students, the performance is not proportional to the number of workers or number of students. Why? Why? You know, the performance of a group project is not proportional to the number of uh, group members, right? Everyone experienced, right? Why? <laughs> so another issue is, so uh, there, is, there is the communication over it. Uh, so, the work, work cannot be, some, some amount of work cannot be divided. Okay. A certain part of work can be divided very easily, and then the divided, divided work can be assigned to multiple workers. But some part of work cannot be divided. Then only one worker needs to work for this amount of work. That is the problem. So another issue is the communication overhead. So after that, so after this work is divided, then we need to share the result of this, this, divide, this divided work. But for this share, the information needs to be shared, so which that is required communication between workers. So this is also a very critical problem. So because of this, the performance of the vertical architecture is not proportional to the number of course. So that is also a very critical problem. So which means that customers, customers expect the n times of performance improvement if they purchase and core CPU compared to the single core CPU, but it's not true. Okay, so so okay, this this slide I explained about the multi-core architecture, and then I also explained why multi-core architecture is required to be centric. It is because of our consumption issue. Okay, so now I will introduce about the benchmark application. So actually, until now, so we learned how to measure the performance of a computer system, so how to measure the power consumption of, a, of this computer system. Then actually, then we require standardized applications that, we, that, is, uh, that will be used for measuring the performance of a computer system. And then these type these applications are called benchmark. So what is it? if we want to compare the performance of two different computer systems, then what is the problem? So actually, oh, I want to run program A to the computer one. And then I want another another person wants to run program B to the computer too. Then what's the problem? Because applications are different, the so different applications are run on the different computer systems, which means that, oh, 
instruction count is different. Which means we, we cannot compare the performance of these two different computer systems using the different application. So which means that we require standardized application which can be used for measuring the performance of computer systems, right? And then this type of application is called the benchmark. And then the most popular benchmark of doing is spec CPU benchmark. Okay. Actually, the spec is the abbreviation of the standard performance evaluation corporation. Okay, so the spec S P is this. And then they collect the, the popular application and then they provide them with a bunch of applications as benchmark for CPUs. So we can use the spec CPU 2006 to uh, compare the performance of uh, CPU. And then recently they uh, made the CPU 2017. Okay. So using the benchmark, then we can uh, run the, this benchmark on the computer system, and then we can measure the performance of the computer system. Also, there are many kinds of applications such as the C into 2006, and then this is used for uh, measuring the performance of the integer instruction, and then CSP into 2006, and then this is used for uh, measuring the performance of floating point instruction. And Let's see how we can uh, measure the performance of uh, CPU using spec in 2017. Okay? So you can find the name of an application here. So you can find Perlbench and the GCC in the compiler. Also, spec also provides the number of instructions. So actually, these this is the uh, application, so it, so which means that this is the this application or uh, is composed of high-level language code, and then this application is translated into the target CPU architecture, like the x86. So in this example, the target CPU is the Intel Xeon, so Intel Xeon is the x86 architecture. So. After comparison, so we can measure the number of instructions for this benchmark. And then for CPI, and then also clock frequency is the same because the hardware is the same. Then we can measure the execution time here. So this execution time is the execution time by new, new CPU. Okay. Then what is the this, this time? It's the reference time. So in the previous class, we just define the performance. Performance is the one over execution time. But in order to measure the performance of a certain system, the performance of this system needs to be compared to the baseline system, so reference system. So it means that we can measure the performance of a, a, system, a certain system by comparing the performance of a reference system, okay? Because any lot of the performance metric, and we just, uh, we just learned that P of A is higher than the P of B. The performance of A is higher n times faster than, uh, n times higher than performance B, right? So this execution time is compared by reference time. The, refer the execution time of a reference machine. Then we can calculate the spec ratio. This spec ratio represents the this is so the execution time of a reference machine is the one seven, seventeen seven seventy four. Then this is the execution time of zero. So it is divided by 
six point six point seven. So it becomes the step ratio of this one. And then by applying geometry B for the step ratio, and you can calculate the uh, performance of you know. So that's how uh, we can how how to use exact benchmark to measure the performance of a computer system. So which this is the geometry mean. So which means that oh it is geo processor this system is 2.3 times higher the performance of this system is 2.3 times as higher than the reference machine. Okay. So we can use the spec like this also we can use spec power to measure the power consumption of a popular system. So this is the, uh, but the power consumption is a little bit uh, complex. It is because the power consumption um, is changed by amount of workload. So this is the uh, equation, but, uh, but this is the example. So we can use the step power to measure the power consumption through the system. But we can find the target load. So this is the amount of work assigned to the control system. Okay, the zero percent, zero percent to hundred percent. And this is the performance. So this is the, the kind of uh, operation that represents the performance. And then this is the average power of a system. So, what can you observe? The if, if the target load is zero, which means the control is done, I can see there is no workload, so the, this computer does nothing. But power is consumed. If the workload amount of the workload is a hundred ten percent, the power becomes the one fifteen. So this is very interesting. The power consumption is not proportional to the amount of work in the computer system. That's also the research uh, area of the this uh, uh, computer system. So actually, it's very uh, critical for server computer system, server, server infrastructure or data center. The problem is that even though the data center is idle, this data center consume power. Also, another problem is that oh, only few people is using this server computer system, which means the it's just the ten percent or ten percent of it. A computer system is used, but the power consumption, power consumption is very high. So the graph it looks like this. So this is the uh, the workload, and this is the power. And so actually, the power is, is even though the workload target load is zero percent, and the power is consumed, and then it is dramatically increased until this point, and then slightly increased. So this is the proportional. If if the power consumption is proportional to the workload and the graph looks like this, but in reality graph looks like this. So power consumption the cost the cost the running cost of a computer system is not proportional to the amount of workload. So that is the another issue of the data center actually. Okay, so this is the power proportion of the rock. Okay, so so I will stop here so this time so I just explain about the power consumption the power consumption issue of the computer system. Also I explain about the analysis then H1. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so thank you for your listening and then here is the next plan.